<laughs> all right. Well, I guess that's a movie we'd all like to see, huh? <laughs> well, thank you so much. I know this is a, really a marquee uh, conversation. I've personally been looking forward to hearing what our incredible panel has to say this afternoon. So without further ado, uh, I think we're going to run, jump right into it. And let me just quickly introduce this, uh, this terrific group of people to talk about Russia, the US, what comes next, uh, starting from the southern end, we have Vladimir Milov, uh, who is not only the former deputy energy minister of Russia, but most relevantly to our conversation today, he is really the chief political advisor to Alexei Navalny's campaign in Russia. So we're delighted to have him here with us today. We have Ukraine's foreign minister, uh, Pavlo Klimkin, who uh, I think has been a most valuable contributor already to this conversation, Senator Jean Shaheen. She was, by the way, the very first US senator to call for a hearing into the investigation of what was happening with Russia's intervention in the US election. She did that in September, folks, of 2016. Uh, so she's been getting some hearings, <laughs> unfortunately, wow. after the fact, yes. after the fact. And of course, we have Poland's Minister of Defense here with us as well today, Antoni Maskarevich. We're delighted to have him with us. And so this is, this is a group that maybe we should start at the end of that movie. Uh, you know, it basically, you see those images from 1989 now, don't you? And they seem almost astonishing in that, that moment of hope that's so far away. Somebody said to me recently, maybe 1989 was the best year of our lives, but we just didn't know it at the time. It certainly feels like a different political moment. So I want to start out by asking everyone on the panel, and we'll start with our Russian uh, here, as the first person, are we in a new Cold War? Uh, and if so, you know, who, who's fighting it? Well, this seems like a war without any definition. What's, what's your view? I wouldn't go so far to call it a Cold War, but we're definitely in a changing environment because in uh, 89, 91, when Francis Fukuyama was rushing a little bit too much ahead with uh, uh, end of history uh, uh, publication, uh, we all thought that what's going to happen next is that uh, the liberal world order would advance and autocracies would continue to collapse and basically in a few decades from now uh, we will have a world uh, which is uh, largely functioning as a democracy moving forward and so on. What we have is actually a resurgence of a number of autocracies uh, who are getting the upper hand, becoming stronger, pursue certain strategic goals, and importantly, act together on the most important issues, uh, establishing some form of a cartel, if you will, to advance their interests and to defend themselves from uh, uh, continued advance of the liberal order. So Russia is not an exception, it's just a natural part of what we see in uh, different parts of the world, the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. So we see that the liberal order is in retreat, uh, and the autocracies are on the rise. They're active decisively, uh, trying to disrupt uh, further advances of uh, liberal democratic world. And uh, of course, Russia is one of the most important players here. But is there going to be a 1989 moment again? I mean, you know, are people going to stand on the wall and say no more Putin? We have to fight for it. Uh, it doesn't come, this new 89 moment doesn't come as a given. Uh, we see, uh, for instance, very dangerous, let's not even talk about what's happening in the United States now, but uh, certain countries which are uh, members of the European Union, uh, who were thought to be uh, established democracies from now on and forever. Right now, actually, we see similar autocratic trends, dismantling of democratic institutions within the European Union. Uh, and I think first, point number one, since we are here, is for the people from the Western world. I can share a lot of experience how gradually democratic institutions are being dismantled in a country where people, the establishment, business basically thinks, oh, it's a given, it's going to take place forever, nobody's going to take away our rights. And then slowly but surely, step by step, this, be, this is being taken away from us. I have observed this uh, process uh, since day one when uh, Vladimir Putin came to power 18 years ago. I can share a lot of uh, experience and I see that a lot of people in the Western world are not really paying attention to what is happening 
inside America, inside Europe, uh, which is actually eroding a lot of democratic institutions. Russia was unfortunately on the forefront of this process. So we have a lot to say and we should never let this happen. We should fight back. Ukraine is fighting back, not necessarily uh, of its choosing uh, a war. What, what is your view about uh, this? Uh, look, uh, I don't believe we are in a Cold War. I believe we are in a real war and not only Ukraine. What else after Georgia, Ukraine, UK, Spain, Catalonia, the Netherlands, US, it just to name a few, would you need to start acting? It's not a military conflict like in Ukraine, but uh, Russia has been raging hybrid war, real hybrid war against the West, against the Western institution and against the citizens against the people here. And after all that, we still have, uh, we, we still don't have a sort of common narrative uh, on, on the nature of this war. We still don't have the common narrative how to counter Russian hybrid threats. And it's about everything. It's about meddling into elections, it's about fake news, it's about propaganda, it's about cyber, it's about economy. So it's about everything what could be called hybrid. Of course it's still different uh, from Ukraine, but fundamentally we are still, you know, a gap apart from clear understanding about, uh, you know, perceiving uh, this hybrid war as a call for actions as a call for concerted and coordinated actions against Russia. And the second, very, very simple point. I'm a bit perplexed by, by the title of our panel. Of course, it's about, you know, provoking a bit. It's great, of course. <laughs> but what kind of Russia we are talking about? We are talking about Russia where Stalin is the most popular leader of the Russians ever. We are speaking, we are talking about the country where monuments of Stalin uh, are erected again and the flowers are laid. We are talking about the country that over recent 10 years, the, you know, uh, we have less and less people who believe uh, that Stalin uh, committed a lot of atrocities. It's now about 30 plus percent. 10 years before it was 70 plus. So, uh, and many of my f friends from Europe tell me, look, Pablo, if we turn down the, you know, the soul, uh, the channel of propaganda in Russia, maybe Russia is good again in a year. So my point not. Let's, let's be fair what kind of uh, country we are dealing with. And we all remember, after the Georgian war, partnership for modernization, reset, all kind of good things. And where are we now with all this reset and partnership of modernization? Nowhere. Okay, Cold War? And if so, is Washington even fighting it? Um, I don't think we're seeing a resurgence of the Cold War, actually. And you know, my issue, and I don't think the US government's issue, is not with the Russian people. It's with Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin and the aggressive actions that they have been taking against the West. And be very, let's be very clear that just as they are engaged in a military buildup, they are engaged, as the minister says, in hybrid warfare that is designed to undermine the faith that democ people in democracies have in their own governments and institutions. That's clearly what is going on, and they need to pay a price for that. Now, one of the things that has united the American Congress has been concern about what Russia is doing, and we passed our sanctions bill in response to their interference in our elections. And regardless of partisanship around the elections, there is a united front saying that we have got to hold Russia accountable for their efforts to undermine our democracy. And, you know, I think that that bipartisan effort to be responsive and to try and hold them accountable will continue. Minister Muscarevich, I know you have said recently uh, in an interview that uh, President Putin wants Ukraine and that he needs Ukraine to restore his empire. So I'm guessing you agree that uh, he is at war in some way with the West. Yes, of course, I agree. Uh, excuse me, I will speak in, in, in Polish, okay? 
please. So, of course, I do agree. I do agree, and there is no doubt. There is no doubt that the current state exceeds what we can call a Cold War. Open war is what is going on in Ukraine, and this is an aggression that breaks all rules of a civilized world. It breaks the international order in Europe, and at the same time, it openly states that Russia that Russia gives itself the right to change the systems and borders of European countries in that manner. But of course, this, not, this is not everything, because hybrid war, uh, IT war, or, does not only include Europe, but also the United States of America, and it is being executed in a very aggressive way and a very intense way, and we have not seen this level of determination in history. Partially, this is the result of a synthesis between uh, the technical and modern possibilities that we have nowadays and the Russian tradition of in of misleading and introducing disinformation as a fundamental tool of war uh, conducted by Russia. And finally, the third element that one has to mention, obviously, because without that the image would be not complete, is namely what happens in far Asia, what happens in North Korea. From the Polish point of view, the activity of North Korea are strictly correlated and connected with the Russian plans and with aggressive activities of the Russian Federation. If we don't take this into consideration, we will never understand the scale of aggression and the scale of plans that Russia for the time being realizes. This is not Cold War anymore. And uh, also the results of the Zapad 17 exercises um, proved that the Zapad exercises finished two months ago, starting with the Arctic Sea up to the Black Sea, all together with uh, ballistic missile exercises, with Iskander missile exercises that can be equipped with um, uh, nuclear and also and not to they did not prepare for defense they prepared for aggression so from this point of view Poland has to accept the assumption that this is not Cold War but this is the introduction to a hot war brought up that military situation right now so I want to go back to both of you and talk about in recent days it's uh, just yesterday, I believe, the $10.5 billion uh, sale of Patriot missiles was approved by the State Department to follow up on President Trump's visit. Uh, we have reports that um, the Ukrainian arms sale uh, uh, may finally come through, uh, that the Trump administration is now considering a $47 million uh, package for Ukraine that would include uh, uh, tank weapons. Uh, anti-tank weapons. So first of all, Minister Klimkin, is that is that accurate? Do you now expect that uh, the U.S. will step up its uh, presence, really, in this conflict between Russia and Ukraine? Will we finally be taking this step that's been debated for so long? Uh, look, firstly, the whole uh, countering of Russian aggression would not have been possible without uh, solidarity and international support. We started fighting against the Russians, basically with the weapons of 20th century, against the Russian army, fighting with the weapons of the 21st century. 
It was a fundamental gap between uh, our military forces. In these three and a half years, we've been building up new Ukrainian military forces. And it's not just about little weapons. So fundamentally for me, what matters, and, and I'm really serious is that, it's, it's not a slogan, it's fighting spirit. You know, whenever I talk to our officers and soldiers, what I fundamentally feel is this fighting spirit. And the second point, our ability to give them all kind of weaponry of the 21st century. And it's not just about anti-tank weapons, it's about electronic warfare, it's about drones, it's about counter-battery. So what we need is to have all this equipment, to have all this logistical support, but also training. And uh, we've been having also our US friends, Polish friends, training with our guys together. And it's a, it's a reciprocal exercise because we've been giving them our experience how to fight the Russians. So it's, it's about everything. It's just not about one Peace in this jigsaw is not just about javelins, it's not just about that. But of course we've been working on getting more military equipment. We've been getting better, but we need this international support and we will definitely get it. So you, that's a yes, just to be clear for, uh, for everyone here. You, you now think that the president is going to approve this package? I believe that we will definitely get more defensive weapons and military equipment in the future. I can't say you, you know, the exact day, but we've been working on that. Okay, so I want to I wanna ask everybody here, this is related. The Trump question is, is kind of the, the elephant in this, in this room, so to speak. Uh, how much do President Trump's words matter on the ground in Ukraine, on the ground in Poland, on the ground as NATO tries to figure out what to do. You know, we've seen him repeatedly, including just last week, once again, uh, you know, talk in positive terms about President Putin, suggest that he believes President Putin's account. There's a big debate in Washington, and I'm sure around the world, what do we make of those words? So I would love some ground truth from Poland, Washington, Russia, and Ukraine. Ground truth about President Trump and what his words mean. There's, you can start, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay, I can. Zarówno ja. I personally, as a Pole and as the Minister of National Defense, but also millions of millions of Poles, we mostly remember the words that President Donald Trump said in Warsaw on a square where the members of the Warsaw Uprising were fighting. And he said that the United States will always stand with Poland when any aggression from the East will be a threat. And Article 5 of the Washington Treaty will be always by the United States respected and executed. As the Minister of National Defense, I always want, also want to say that never ever a president has supported the deployment of NATO and US troops on the eastern flank, just like the present uh, administration. It is thanks to this administration, actually every single month we see an increasing number of US troops on the eastern flank. And Poland buys the most modern weapons that are able to secure peace security in the face of the Russian threat. The practice of the administration of President Trump is the same like the words that he said in the face of millions of Poles in Warsaw in July this year. And those words for us are credible. Are those the words you think about when you think about President Trump and Russia? Um, well, I would point out that the European, what is now the European Deterrence Initiative, actually began under the Obama administration. So those troops were headed for Poland um, before the the changeover in administration, which I think has been very important. And I was in Poland in February and heard how much the Poles appreciated having that reassurance 
and country. Um, so I, I do think that was very important. I, I think, however, that it's important, as we all know, to have the United States on the same page from the President through the State Department, through the Department of Defense. And what we have had from um, our current President is confusing messages about where he is on Putin and Russia. Um, that has not been, it's been contradicted, I think, um, some of the, his initial comments on NATO, on um, the importance of the EU, um, were not supported by Vice President Pence, by Secretary Mattis, by the establishment. But it sends a confusing message to um, the world and also to Vladimir Putin about what our real intentions are in a way that could allow for miscalculation from Putin about how we would respond to certain aggression. So I think in that respect, it's, it's not helpful as we look at how we address um, what's going on in Europe, what's happening in Ukraine, um, where you know, the United States has been very supportive of Ukraine's independence and very opposed to Russian action in Crimea and in the Donbass. So um, getting everybody on the same page is very important, and it's a continuing challenge. What does it mean on the ground uh, to have President Trump sending conflicting messages, Minister Klimkin? Yes, uh, when, when we are fighting in Ukraine, of course we are fighting for us, uh, for our future, how we understand it. And we understand it as European and democratic Ukraine. But at the same time, I believe we are fighting not only for the eastern flank of the transatlantic community, but for the whole transatlantic community itself as a part of this community. So support for Ukraine is in a way uh, absolutely natural. And Ukraine uh, became, in a way, uh, an indispensable ally, not only for US, where we always enjoyed uh, bipartisan support, but for the whole transatlantic world. And I met, you know, answering directly your point, President Trump uh, three times, uh, two times with the president, once bilaterally. And his message was always a message of clear, clear solidarity. You know, we are with you, we are with you with the Ukrainians. So, and I perceive this message as total support for, uh, for Ukraine and for our fight, whether it's on security, whether it's on support uh, for our reforms. And fundamentally, there, there should be just one clear point. You can talk to Russia only from the point of strength. Because otherwise, you can't counter all kind of Russian war against the Western world. You can't uh, fight all this propaganda. And you can't uh, fight, basically, the way how Russia broke all the international law and trust. Because before the war, before the occupation of Crimea and Donbass, the basic international model was based on international law and trust and interest. Now international law is not there, trust is not there. What is left basically is the interest and uh, to such countries like, uh, like Russia, and I mean not Russia, but the Kremlin regime. You can only talk from the point of strength because they don't understand any other language. So, Vladimir, how does it play inside of Russia itself? You know, we had a very interesting conversation before we came out here about this question of how much Russians themselves are paying attention to this whole conversation about President Putin and, and the West. Uh, well, uh, just let me finish this conversation about Trump because uh, actually we suffered a terrible blow in the past 12 months. Uh, while we are promoting the Western liberal democratic values, we always offer the Western countries as a role model, as an example. How do we build a normal society in Russia? Oh, take a look. There it exists. And in the past 12 months, it became much more difficult because basically people look at this and say, but they elected essentially the same guy as ours. <laughs> What's the difference? And uh, particularly when Mr. It's uh, far more important at times what President Trump doesn't say and who he is and how he behaves 
than certain uh, official statements that he occasionally makes on uh, Ukraine, Poland, Eastern Europe, or whatever, he never ever said a bad word about Vladimir Putin, who deserves this in the first place. Never ever. Not a single bad word, neither during his campaign nor uh, during his presidency. Look, uh, Russians probably have a better capability to read behind the lines than most nations in the world, you know. So we clearly understand the message. We clearly understand the message. It is there, right? Not to mention uh, speaking about uh, NATO being obsolete and Europeans not spending enough on defense and we are forced to spend more to defend you at our expense and stuff like that. This is music to Kremlin ears and this is actually uh, in, a lot of, in, in the eyes of a lot of people in Russia who pay attention, uh, this is extremely destructive. But the good news, I have to say, is that a lot of people perceive these headlines of like 90% support for Putin, which we have been reading for the past uh, three and something years after the Crimea, as a face value. Like everybody loves him and he enjoys uh, universal support and whatever he does. Not exactly so, uh, because for instance, even the same pollsters which give uh, Putin great support of the Russians, they say that there was a sharp drop in the overall interest in foreign policy in this whole geopolitical games. There's a very clear demand uh, from people to refocus on the Russian domestic affairs, which are in dire straits. We have uh, the most difficult economic crisis since the collapse of the Soviet Union. But on television, they continue to talk about Ukraine, continue to talk about the European Union, Catalonia, United States, Syria, whatever. Uh, this raises a lot of discontent. So on the ground, actually, things are not what they seem on surface, and uh, there is a clear demand from the society to uh, refocus on domestic issues and fix them, which is something that the government is not doing, and this is something that gives steam to Alexei Navalny's presidential campaign. Might talk about it a little bit later. Well, you mentioned Navalny's campaign, which you're running, but he's not going to be allowed to run. So how is well, that Well, that's an open there? question. That's an open question. This is what Putin wants you to think that he will never step down from power, he will be forever, and Navalny will never be allowed to run. Mm -hmm. Both uh, formulas are not true. Uh, there is a clear legal pattern forward, how to register Navalny. This law which bans him from, from running is unconstitutional. As a matter of fact, this law was declared unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court more than a dozen times on different provisions, but still, reputation of this law is disastrous. His sentence, criminal sentence, was already overturned, word by word, similar sentence by European Court for Human Rights and the Russian Supreme Court, and we will make that happen again. So there is a legal, uh, legal way to get him uh, registered, uh, but we have to fight for it. It's a matter of, uh, it's a matter of constant fight. Mm -hmm. And so how do you explain the opposition candidacy uh, of Ksenia Sobchak? Is that uh, a story that will be sufficient to uh, bring people out to the polls in March if, if Navalny is not allowed to run? Uh, you saw a picture of like in you know some open military conflict, like a helicopter flies and it shoots some false targets. You know, so that so if somebody fires an anti-aircraft missile, it is more likely to hit the false target than the helicopter itself. This is what Ksenia Sobchak is all about. <laughs> okay, Minister Klimtan, I want to I want to make sure we bring in. Uh, do, do you want to have a quick intervention here, sir? Okay, I, I do want to bring in our audience in just one second. Let me ask you quickly. There is a proposal out there. It's not clear how serious yet for peacekeepers uh, and to make this next step in, in Ukraine conflict. Is that a serious effort in your view? And uh, is it in President Putin's interest Absolutely to uh, do something like that and to end the conflict before the election? No, it's just another, it's just another attempt uh, to do some sort of a camouflage move. Yeah. Uh, to actually <laughs> so it's like Ksenia Sobchak. Is that the Ksenia Sobchak? We, we Sobchak already move? had an experience with Russian proposals on peacekeepers and other frozen conflicts. All of them were disastrous. So never trust this guy who is the president of Russia. <laughs> is, it, is that your view too? <laughs> uh, look. Uh, I, I don't know how dangerous Ksenia Sobchak is for the Russian presidential elections, but uh, the trick behind Putin's idea on peacekeepers is really dangerous. Because the idea itself is really worth while discussing. It's a serious idea. But the Putin's narrative uh, behind it is to legitimize Russian protectorate, is to start talking to, Russia, to Russian proxies on the ground, uh, 
is to create a kind of bodyguard mission for the OSCE, which would basically create a total stalemate on the ground. Uh, the idea is to put uh, these peacekeepers only along the touchline, which would freeze up the whole situation and create another border. The whole occupied territory would be nowhere. And the uncontrolled part of the Ukrainian-Russian border, where we've been having continuous inflow of regular troops, weaponry, munitions, and mercenaries, will be out of control. So it's a very dangerous trick in the sense of saying, aha, uh -huh, you want peacekeepers? They are not real peacekeepers, they are quiet bodyguards. But for that, you need uh, basically to freeze up the situation. You need to start talking to uh, our proxies, to our protectorate, because Putin does not care about Donbass at all. The whole idea is about Ukraine. And the idea is to create out of Donbass pretext a sort of federalization of Ukraine to fragment and to weaken up Ukraine, to create a quasi-federalization with the veto right for the decisions of, of the central government. So no foreign policy, no economic policy, no defense policy, basically nothing. A kind of, uh, you know, vague uh, area where Russia would be able to steer everything. So peacekeepers are fine in itself, but not uh, along the narrative uh, presented by, uh, by the Russians. So I see a lot of head nodding, but I know we want to get to our audience as well. So if you have something quickly to add on this point. Let me just real quick say that I applaud Kirk Volker's um, efforts in this area. I think it's important for us. But what's being here. proposed by the Russians is a total non-starter. I totally agree with both of you. Absolutely. It was a very short message. The message was, I agree. Here we go. We'll take Jamie Kerchick there, and then we'll. Nice. Uh, Jamie Kerchick from the Brookings Institution. This is primarily for Senator Shaheen, but anyone else can take it. Do you think the Russians got what they wanted in Donald Trump? Nice short question. <laughs> I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, I can tell you that, as I said, one of the things that has happened in response to what they did is they've united the Congress. Um, and they certainly weren't anticipating that. And I do think that as we hear more and more of their meddling in Spain and Catalonia and the EU with Brexit, or the UK with Brexit, as we hear what they tried to do in France, I think it's not yet clear what they might have done in Germany. Um, there is a growing backlash in a way that also unites uh, the West, as we haven't seen in some time, on Russia. And I think that may actually undermine, uh, or be the start of undermining what Putin's trying to do. Any other takers on that? Hey, sir, you've been very patient here. From many years. Thank you. I'm, I'm Michael Basuki. I'm a former spokesperson for the yes. OSC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. So I spent a lot of time on both sides of the contact line. It now looks like the uh, so-called conflict is turning into a slow burn, um, you know, frozen conflict. Diplomatic toolbox seems to be empty in terms of finding a solution. Now that things have gone on for so long, and in fact, it now looks like the rebels are targeting the Donetsk water filtration station where there's chlorine stored. It now looks like they're able to get coal out of Donbass, sell it to places like Poland, according to reports. What is it that will really make Russia, the Russian-backed rebels, feel the burn? Will it be increased sanctions? Uh, will it be other targeted measures? Because it does look like it's going to stay for quite some time. And perhaps this is for Minister Klimkin, anyone else who can. Thank you. It, it's, it's again a total mythology. There are no independent fighters for, you know, Donbass independence, for freedom, for, you know. They are a kind of gangs, or better to say, a batch of gangs of criminals and semi-criminals, fully controlled by Russian militaries and special services. Point. 
So the whole batch of actions should be targeted against Russia itself, not against Donbas. In Donbas, we have now almost humanitarian, humanitarian and uh, environmental catastrophe because a considerable number of coal mines are now filled with water. You mentioned yourself that water supply is targeted, ele electrical supply is targeted, but they don't care because they fundamentally are involved in all kind of smuggling and uh, all kind of gray and black operations. So what we have to do is to target Russia with more political pressure and solidarity, definitely with more sanctions, but we, ha we don't have shared narrative on that. But also what I have told, with all kind of this uh, hybrid warfare against the West, there, there should be coordinated answer on how to counter all these threats. Otherwise, it would be, you know, Russia has been handling insecurity like a kind of commodity on stock exchange. Here is Georgia, here is Donbas, Syria, you know, North Korea, you know, not, next time it will be something else. Without the coordinated countering of all these efforts, there would be no way to sort out uh, Donbas and, and other places which are burning, as you said. Okay, let's get a few more here. Uh, Alina. Thank you, Alina Polyakova, Brookings Institution. Uh, we haven't talked about sanctions explicitly. Um, I think, uh, Senator Shaheen, you're correct that uh, the, Russia has become the bipartisan issue in Congress, which was not really expected by uh, the Russians or I think anybody else, frankly. Um, but you know, have sanctions actually had the kinds of policy outcome that was intended vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Russians? Uh, the legislation that passed um, and that President Trump signed, it seems like the White House is basically doing nothing to implement those sanctions. Um, so I'd like to take, you know, hear your view, Senator, on what, how the Congress can actually pressure the White House to follow the law. And on the other hand, if sanctions are the only policy tool we actually have at the transatlantic level, and have they had the right uh, outcome that was intended? Um, well, I think the sanctions have not yet worked in the way we hope them to. I think the administration has been slow to implement those, and Congress needs to hold their feet to the fire to do that, and I think there is a growing awareness in Congress about that. Um, I think in addition to the sanctions, we're seeing a number of actions that were talked about yesterday and earlier today with respect to NATO and what NATO is doing and the positioning of troops um, in the Baltics, in Poland, um, on continued support for Ukraine and what's happening there. So I think we have a number of other things that we should be doing and that we are doing to address um, Russian aggression. The area where I think we have the most to do and where I think we're still um, developing a coordinated response is in the area of cyber and disinformation. And one of the challenges, and I've been struggling with this, I introduced legislation earlier in the year that would address our Foreign Agents Registration Act because we've seen RT and Sputnik in the United States um, spreading disinformation uh, directly from the Kremlin without any warning to American citizens about who's paying for it and whether this information is really accurate. And We've been struggling with that because in a free society where we believe in our constitutional right to free speech, um, the Russians have been very effective at taking advantage of that. And so we've got to continue to think about how to respond to that and how to uh, address the Russian propaganda, which, which we did a pretty good job of during the Cold War. As we're talking about the Cold War, we had a whole apparatus to address that. And that's all been dismantled. And so we're really starting again um, with trying to figure out how best to respond. So much head nodding here. And I think we'll take a couple questions at a time now, given that I see so many hands up still. Uh, you, sir, I promised, David Kramer, and you. So th these three, OK? Uh, Andrew Wood, Chatham House, Russia program. There's all sorts of ways of phrasing this, but I'll do it very simply because of time. How far do you think there will be changes if 
by foul means or fair, Putin wins a further term in office, by which I mean how far will it deteriorate? Thank you. Uh, David Kramer, Florida International University. My question is for you, Vladimir. Um, Putin's greatest export, I would argue, is corruption. But in order to export it, we import it in the West. But they also, his circle, keeps its money, in many respects, in the West. How vulnerable is Putin and his circle if we actually really targeted these assets and went after them in a serious way? Good question. All right, third one, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Spalazza from Georgia. Uh, hybrid war in my country has been started 25 years ago. It was before the Putin. It was Yeltsin's time. Then, in the Putin's time, it just uh, Russia just advanced this technology. 2008, it was direct aggression in Georgia, and it was followed by reset. Reset was followed by Ukraine, and after Ukraine, it still took some time uh, until the West gained this understanding that Russia is a real threat. And today, Russia pays political price for its aggression in Ukraine, not for Georgia, but it's also good that it start paid for Ukraine. But uh, what I'm really afraid of uh, that tomorrow, if the Kremlin regime uh, is uh, so wise to change his mask and change Putin with more pleasant uh, face. Uh, the West still fall in love and start the new flirt with Russia, which will be disaster for our countries. That's why what we are talking about the rapprochement and the post-Putin era. I think we have to take in consideration that security guarantees for the countries are sacrificing for democracy is the crucial. So tell me, please, if I am wrong. <laughs> okay. So, do you want to try uh, any of those? Yes, I would like to say two sentences. So, first of all, one has to be clear that no Russian ruler for many years, tens of years actually, if not longer, did not lead to such a backwards movement of the Russian interests like the aggressive posture of Putin. Starting with the 17th century for Russia, the fundament of its empire was Ukraine. Putin lost Ukraine forever. What uh, happened between Ukraine and Russia resulted in a situation that Ukraine, as an independent country, created itself in a stable and for and in a way forever different than Russia. This means a deep geopolitical Russian change. Second of all, starting with World War II, all Russian rulers were mostly afraid of a situation in which NATO and US troops would be close to their borders. Putin led to such a situation because of his aggressive policy. And this shows that the only effective way to counteract Putin is a broad portfolio of tools. This that you mentioned uh, hitting his financial means, what you said also, uh, touch, uh, hitting him via sanctions that would decrease the economical development. But what is most important is a military reaction because Russia is afraid of the fact that their power will be stopped with the power of the free world. Thank you. On this point, uh, maybe it would be a good idea for you to go to Sochi, to Valdai, and ask Putin about how he sees his political legacy. <laughs> it's it's not about uh, uh, you know figuring out here in Halifax, but I believe uh, it's 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 pretty straightforward. It's not about you know very difficult criminology. He sees Russia as a special area, a kind of successor of empire with special set of values. All empires 
normally control their territory and their people. They have spheres of influence, and they talk to other empire, empires to decide the fate of the world. It's exactly, you know, the sense of how Putin sees uh, the future for Russia. In what way he is able to reach his goal? In a different one. Because you, you started uh, talking about Cold War. You know, you know, over the Cold War, there were no attempts to meddle in elections in the West. There were no attempt to create propaganda on industrial scale. It was Russian-Soviet propaganda, definitely, we all remember it, but completely different one. And there were no attempts to create the whole hybrid warfare. But I believe Russia will be able and willing to go as far as to deliver this point. Empire controlling its territory and people, there, it's a uh, it's sphere of influence in talking to other empires in the world. Very simple, unfortunately. You want to answer uh, David's question, Vladimir? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to touch also on the presidential election uh, thing. Uh, th I think Putin doesn't have really a good scenario of extending his mandate for another six years because, again, uh, since the Crimea annexation, we have been living under a notion that he enjoys like 90% support how much, you name it, right? Uh, but this is all opinion polls. Uh, it's a big question whether it's uh, credible or not. So what he needs from this election is a mandate uh, that actually proves that, yes, he got a supremacy and uh, nobody else can compete with him. Already this scenario does not work. Because if he allows Navalny into the race, there will be a real contested election and a lot of trouble for him. If he bans Navalny and chooses to run against uh, three elderly gentlemen, uh, toothless, being around for 25 years, plus Ksenia Sobchak, this, is, this will be a joke. This will not be serious, and a lot of people, including the establishment, will get it. Uh, so, and and uh, on the other hand, the movement that I represent is arguably the strongest bottom-up protest movement in, in a quarter of a century, since 91, essentially. You see that geographically it spreads all over more than 100 cities in Russia, uh, cities that were never on the political map uh, in our country. So uh, we, will, we are committed to tearing him down from the pedestal. He may extend his mandate, but there will be a lot of trouble for him. And uh, you probably have seen it uh, in the pictures from uh, Moscow and street rallies where we have a lot of riot police blocking Tverskaya and thousands of people protesting regardless that the rally is forbidden and so. So uh, his, his quiet life has ended despite the fact that he still probably most likely will extend his mandate, but we are committed uh, to actually deprive him of uh, easy living. Now on David's question, importantly, uh, imports of corruption exist because of demand. Uh, many people uh, become very wealthy by accommodating all these corrupt capitals, not only from Russia. I have been asking myself this question many times. Why is that, that the West is so concerned about Putin, but is actually not doing anything to target these corrupt capitals uh, uh, that are there? Now, my version is very simple, because this will send a bad signal to all the corrupt folks from these other autocratic regimes. Uh, if they came after Russians, they might come after you name it, right? So I think that's, <laughs> that's the reason why. It, it will indeed be a big trouble, although Putin and his cronies started to relocate capitals to places like you know, Singapore, Emirates, Hong Kong, whatever. But uh, this will be indeed a blow, uh, but I don't see it likely taking place because of the reason I just mentioned. All right, Senator Shaheen, I think we're about to get the hook. We, and Final question from Julia Yaffe, if we have 30 seconds. I just Give wanted to answer. add to that. I, I think it's not just that. And I think you're right, David. We need to take a look at that, shutting down that money that's being laundered through um, legitimate um, firms and institutions in the United States and the West. But one of the problems is there are too many people making a lot of money that way, and that that's one of the challenges with addressing it. OK. Final question, and then we'll get our panelists for a final lightning round, or we'll get in trouble. Hi, Julia Yaffe from The Atlantic. Thank you for this excellent panel. This is a question for the Polish minister, Mr. Mazarewicz. Um, do you have any comment uh, on the Polish march that we saw, or the big 
rosary event to kind of, you know, pray the Muslim migrants away from Poland. To what extent do things like this fit into the European project, and to what extent do they play into Vladimir Putin's propaganda about resurgent kind of nationalists that flirts, nationalism that almost flirts with uh, neo-Nazism? Thank you. I'm very pleased that you highlighted this Putin element in the paroles. Uh, yes, uh, this was a uh, Russian provocation. As you know, out of 60,000 great Polish patriots that showed their pride due to regaining independence in this march, it was Putin, I agree with you when it comes to the Putin direction. In this march were put a couple of people that who hold banners with mottos that were never said, because in Poland you never found paroles that, for example, white power is to rule in Poland. This is absurd. This is way of thinking that never ever was present in Poland. But in Russia, around Putin, such paroles were really present. And of course, it is clear that all, everyone in Poland condemned this unanimously, because this was Russian provocation. Have, uh, aiming at a depreciation of the Polish patriotism in the eyes of the West, luckily and successfully. Thank you. End it on the note of Poland instead of Russia. But I want to thank you, Minister. I want to thank you, Minister, Senator Vladimir Milov, and all these fantastic questions. Thank you very much. Great job. Please join us for coffee and exhibits in the foyer. The program will resume promptly.